Good morning. We are on day 134 of our Great Bible Truths series. This is Trials and Temptations. We're going to be looking uh, at excerpts from 1 Peter chapter 5, James 1, Ephesians 6, and Philippians 4. So 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you in due time, casting all your worries on him because he cares for you. Be sober and self-controlled. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Withstand him steadfast in your faith, knowing that your brothers who are in the world are undergoing the same sufferings. But may the God of all grace, who called you into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. James 1 now starts off with a similar theme. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you fall into various temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect work, that you may be perfected and complete, lacking nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let God ask in faith, without any doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. For let that man not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But let the brother in humble circumstances glory in his high position. And the rich, in that he is made humble. Because, like the flower in the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with the scorching wind and withers, and the grass and the flower, and it falls, and the beauty of its apparent appearance perishes so also will a rich man fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised to those who love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself tempts no one. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lusts and enticed. Then the lust, when it has conceived, bears sin and the sin, when it is full grown, produces death. Don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom can be no variation, nor turning shadow. Of his own will he gave birth to us by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So in these passages, we just see so much truth, so much about temptation, about resisting temptation, about trials and tribulations building us up. These are the things that we should look for to strengthen us, not wealth and riches. Wealth and riches are fading away or passing away. All good things come. Every good and perfect gift, as it says, come from the Father of lights, the Father of revelation, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we are to seek. This is the glory that we're to glory in, not wealth and riches and the pursuits of happiness, but rather the pursuit of godliness as we resist temptation, as we uh, seek to rely on uh, God and his spirit and uh, turn from the devil and he will flee from us. Uh, now we're going to look at Ephesians chapter six. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against the words, world's rulers of this dark the darkness of this age and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having the utility belt of truth buckled around your waist and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having fitted your feet with the preparation of the good news of peace. Above all, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the spoken word of God. With all prayer and requests, praying at all times in the spirit, being watchful to this end in all perseverance and requests for all the saints. So we see a picture there, and this is a very familiar verse if we've been in church for a while. And most think that Paul is looking there, it's in prison, looking at the Roman guards and seeing their uh, decor breastplates and helmets and and drawing a spiritual parallel drawing for the believer that we're in a warfare we're in war going against the enemy but our warfare is not physical it's spiritual 
We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, meaning our enemies aren't the, the enemies who we see attacking us. Our enemy is not that person persecuting us. Our enemies are spiritual in nature. That person is per persecuting us because of principalities and darkness and high places that is infecting either that person or persons or this world system to fight against Christ, to fight against a, a godly life, a godly perspective and worldview and godly families and churches. We see that we have enemies, but those enemies aren't the people. Those pe enemies aren't flesh and blood. It's demonic, ultimately. Not that every single person is demon-possessed, but we see that Satan is a father of lies. God is a father of light. Satan is a father of lies. And he brings about these lies to uh, manipulate and persuade people to stand against God. Not that they think they're standing against God, but they just are standing for some truth that's not God's truth, or perhaps a twist of the truth. So Paul's telling the believer, how do we stand against these things? Well, we put on the blessed prayer of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the spoken word of God. And so if, if, we, if you take some time and look through these things, what you'll simply see is the way you do that is, is, is to walk in righteousness. How do you put on the, you know, how do you put on this armor? Walk in righteousness. How do you, you know, uh, have the sword of the spirit? Speak the word of God. And the application of these things are spiritual in nature and, and very practical. So there's not some magical way. I remember as a young Christian, I always say, I always hear about the armor of God, but how exactly do we put it on? I know what it is, but how do we put it on? And over time, as I matured, I kind of understood. I never heard anybody actually teach it, but came to the understanding of, well, it's to walk in these ways, right? That's really what Paul is trying to get at. The spiritual war is not taking a sword and fighting, but it's fighting with the very words of God, reading the very word of God himself. Our uh, last uh, passage now is uh, chapter 4, Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. In nothing be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your thoughts in Jesus Christ. So we've seen this theme over and over again of prayer and petition, prayer and petition. So as believers, we're fighting against temptation, we're fighting for the Lord. Our battle is not flesh against flesh and blood, and we, we have the armor of God on, but the way we really uh, apply this, if you will, is not, as I said, is walking in those ways, but what prepares us to walk in those ways is prayer and petition. We ask God, we seek God, we realize these, this is not done in our own strength, but in seeking God and saying, Lord, we need you. We need your daily bread. We need your provision. We need to have power over these struggles and temptations and trials that come our way. Finally, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are honorable, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is any praise, think about these things. So ultimately, the Christian's mind should be geared not towards all the evil in the world, not to fighting against the systems of darkness and tearing them down. That'll happen naturally as we live out the gospel. But our mind should be on the things of which are honorable and pure and lovely and virtuous praiseworthy. This is what our mind should be attentive to. And as we attend our minds to that, sure, we're going to fight against systems of darkness, but we don't put all of our attention towards what is negative. We put it towards what's positive and walk in those things. Have a blessed day. Ponder those things. There's some questions I'll have at the end there to further think about. We'll see you tomorrow.